Welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of sublingual dermoid cyst. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The fabulous images you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show two cases of dermoid cyst of the floor of the mouth, and I'll explain relevant neck anatomy. So starting with the floor of the mouth, that's a horseshoe-shaped area located beneath the tongue and between the sides of the mandible. It's inferiorly bounded by the mylohyoid muscle, which is shaped like a sling or a hammock. And the sublingual space is also located at the floor of the mouth. The sublingual space borders are relevant for this lecture. The main ones medially is the midline genioglossus geniohyoid muscle complex and inferolaterally the mylohyoid muscle. Also note that the anterior margin of the hyoglossus muscle projects into the posterior aspect of that sublingual space. So these muscles are relevant because we can see them quite well on ultrasound and their important anatomic landmarks. Let me show you examples of that. This was a 10-year-old boy that presented with a mass under his chin. So this is a transverse image here where we have the transducer place under the chin. And you can see the first muscle we encounter is this hammock-shaped mylohyoid muscle. And that's draping over this ovoid mass here, which is hypoechoic relative to the adjacent subcutaneous fat. Then we have the geniohyoid muscle followed by the genioglossus. So this is that geniohyoid genioglossus muscle complex we were talking about at the midline. When we turn sagely on that, here's the mandible as a landmark. Again, we have this mylohyoid muscle. We can see that it's draping over this ovoid mass, which has kind of a pseudo-solid appearance. And then we have the geniohyoid muscle. And here we can better see that genioglossus muscle in its fan shape. So if we continue this way, we're going closer to the oral cavity, then we get into the tongue. And when we add color Doppler, we can see that there's no vascular flow because this is a cystic mass. Now, when imaging a floor of the mouth or neck mass, it's a good idea to do some form of dynamic imaging. In this case, we have the patient swallowing while we're imaging in sagittal. So here's the mass here. Notice that with swallowing, the geniohyoid and genioglossus muscles, since they're associated with the tongue, move and somewhat deform the mass. But you can see that it remains bounded by the mylohyoid. It's not protruding beyond that. If it did, we'd be getting into the submental or submandibular space. Instead, this is staying confined within the sublingual space. And this turned out to be a sublingual dermoid cyst. So these are rare benign cysts with squamous epithelial lining, and they contain skin appendages. Now dermoid and epidermoid cysts are in the same family, and the term is often used interchangeably at the floor of the mouth, but technically epidermoid cysts are less common and tend to contain fluid contents only. So they'll usually be more simple in appearance compared to dermoid cysts in this region. The mean age of patient presentation is in the late teens to 20s, average age of 30, and patients might present with a slowly enlarging neck mass that can be asymptomatic, but sometimes it can cause dysphagia. They're often round or oval in shape and homogeneously hypoechoic with punctate echogenic foci, not seen in this case. They may also have that pathognomonic sac of marbles appearance, similar to the floating echogenic spheres that we can sometimes rarely see in dermoid cysts of the ovary. When evaluating these masses on imaging, the relationship to the mylohyoid muscle is key for surgical planning. For example, if the mass is above or superior to the mylohyoid, as in this case, it's sublingual in location, and that allows for intraoral resection. And just to clarify, since this is the patient's chin, and this is the mylohyoid, the mass here is above or superior to the mylohyoid as we're moving towards the oral cavity. However, if the mass is below the mylohyoid, that tells us it's in the submental or submandibular location that would be out here. That would require an extraoral approach. All right, let's look at the second case. So this was a teenage girl presenting with a mass at the floor of the mouth. And initially, the differential diagnosis of a diving ranula was considered. So a ranula is a retention cyst of the salivary gland. The term diving suggests that it's going from the sublingual space below the mylohyoid into the submandibular space. So is it actually doing that? Well, on these axial images, we can see that there's a left-sided hypodense cystic mass here. These are the anterior belly of the digastric muscles. We haven't talked about those yet. And there's the mandible. So when we look at coronal reformatted images, we can see the mass is here. It's curvilinear and somewhat eccentric to the left. So here's the genioglossus muscles, the geniohyoid muscles, and then here's the mylohyoid again. Look at how it's shaped like a sling or a hammock there. And we can see that it looks like the mass is actually bounded by the mylohyoid. So it's not actually plunging down into the submandibular space. And then here's the right and the left anterior belly of the digastric muscle. 
So let's see how that looks on ultrasound. Here's an ultrasound of that same area, transverse image. This is the patient's chin. And we can see again the mylohyoid muscle as this thin hypochloric muscle. It's bounding this mass here, which looks a bit more heterogeneous than the previous dermoid cyst that we reviewed. This one also has punctate echogenic foci throughout. And there's the anterior belly of the digastric muscles that we saw on the CT scan, as well as the geniohyoid muscle. As we adjust the transducer somewhat, we can see that the mass is eccentric and deviated towards the left. Looking at the anatomy, there's the geniohyoid and the mylohyoid telling us we're in the sublingual space. And the mylohyoid actually continues over this way, and it leads us to the adjacent hyoglossus muscle. So remember that the anterior aspect of the hyoglossus muscle protrudes into the posterior aspect of the sublingual space. So that's another anatomic landmark we might see. And here is the left hyoglossus muscle. You can see the mass is kind of protruding down into that portion of the sublingual space. Of note, this is also a good landmark for where the submandibular duct would be located between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus. So if a patient had stone disease involving that duct, you might see it in this region. When we look at real-time imaging, we can get a better sense of all those punctate echogenic foci throughout the mass and also the anatomic landmarks. There's the geniohyoid muscle. On the right, we have the digastric, and then there's the left digastric. And again, we have that mylohyoid muscle draping over the mass and headed over here towards the hyoglossus muscle, where the mass is protruding towards. There's the hyoglossus there. A little difficult to see on this series. Similar to the last case on this color Doppler image, there's no internal vascular flow indicating a lack of solid component. So sublingual dermoid cysts are often midline. This one's a little atypical in that it moves to the left paramedian location. That brings us to the differential for these cysts, which includes suprahyoid thyroglossal duct cysts. Those also tend to be midline, while infrahyoid thyroglossal duct cysts may be paramidline. Sometimes, though, thyroglossal duct cysts can be irregularly shaped and multilocular, unlike dermoid cysts, which tend to be ovoid and rounded and unilocular, but they can have an overlapping appearance. A ranula, as we mentioned, is a mucus retention cyst arising from the sublingual or minor salivary glands. When these are simple, they're unilateral because they'll be located within the sublingual gland, which is at the lateral margins of the floor of the mouth. But when they're diving, they'll plunge from the sublingual space into the submandibular space, or again, they'll plunge through that mylohyoid muscle. So if you see it bounded by the mylohyoid muscle, it's not a diving ranula. An abscess can have an overlapping appearance, but the patient will typically have a clinical history that points towards an oral cavity infection. Lymphangiomas can also occur at the floor of the mouth, but those are more common in the submandibular space as opposed to the sublingual space, which again, sublingual space will be superior to the mylohyoid. All right, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you found this lecture educational. Thanks again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Spotify or Apple or click the subscribe button on YouTube. Also, to see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, please follow us on social media or click the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.